Hallelujah. It's great to be a part of this church. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Just before we go into the message, I want to take a couple of minutes and just talk about our Christmas offering. We refer to it as a Christmas offering, right? But really, it's, it's a Christmas. We do pledges at Christmas time that, uh, for something special over the next year. This past year, uh, we did what we referred to as the loose, uh, tying the loose ends. We, we uh, did a number of things this past year from the special offering. How many were participate in the special offering? Just slip your hand up. There you go. Uh, and I just want to bring a little report of some of the things that we did. Um, last year, this past year, uh, we've had $11,764 come in through that offering. That's great, eh? Some of the things we, we've done with it, uh, we did a bit of an out, update out in the front, took out the, the hedges, put in some, some new sod, uh, had Anthony go and rebuild the sign. Now the sign's not completely finished uh, because as they're rebuilding, putting new, because the in our sign, the lights are all gone in it, and they had to put new bells, new lights in it. But in the process, they broke one of the panels, and uh, this past week, we were getting estimates for replacing the broken panel, so that'll be replaced uh, within the next few weeks, uh, early in the new year. Uh, Anthony, thank you. Not for breaking the panel. That was Tony. <laughs> <laughs> that was Tony that did that. But for, for the work on that and putting a, it now has a, a light sensor in it, so it knows difference between day and night and it comes on when it gets dark and, and stays lit up and has real lights and instead of just one light in it, it's got all the lights in it it's supposed to have. Uh, another thing that we did was uh, uh, we um, freshened the, uh, the driveway. We had that resealed, uh, the asphalt, and then um, the um, projectors were all done from that special offering. The, the uh, the screens, the mounts, the projectors, the cabling. Uh, there's a splitter that's required to boost the signal and give us two projectors. That all came from that offering. Uh, the uh, carpet in the hallways is from that offering. Doesn't that look a lot better? Tony, thank you. <laughs> Tony Martin. But his job is not finished because Esau is getting us tiles and uh, Tony's going to help us put tiles in the washrooms. That's all part of that offering. And uh, Esau is getting us those and uh, we'll get tiles so that the old ugly cushion floor that's in the bathrooms is going to be gone. And uh, we're going to have nice tile floors in there. Uh, another thing, the kitchen was uh, renovated and uh, Cheryl and Esau had a part in that, that the, the, the new back, uh, backsplash. Uh, Tony uh, helped, and, and some of the guys helped put in new range hoods. Uh, that was all part of last year's offering. Uh, and um, to top it off, uh, we also, not from the offering, but also uh, did the uh, fresh gravel in the parking lot. It was nice today to be able to get out on the gravel and not get in the mud. Isn't that right? The question we have is what are we going to do this next year? And uh, what the board has decided that we'd like to do is we'd like to start the process of paving the parking lot. How many are happy about that? We, we got estimates last year and we looked at it and we thought, no, we can't do it. We've, we've thought about it and thought about it. And here's what the, uh, the, uh, the board has come up with is the thought that if we paved the half of the parking lot, it would give us room for 75 cars, which is just about the amount of cars that we have here on a Sunday morning. So if we just did half the parking lot and then did a better job of heavy gravel on the second half as, as an overflow, that we could practically park everyone that comes on a normal Sunday morning. So the goal this next year will to be paved half the parking lot, to pave half the parking lot the board has said that they'll dedicate $20,000, the tower money, will go into the helping paving. Now, to pave half the parking lot, if you remember our estimates from last year, we said to pave it was going to cost $150,000. Good news, half the parking lot is half the price. <laughs> I like that. I like half price sales, which means 
each lot, each spot where you park a car, now let me do the, arith the, the, the math for you. It's going to cost $75,000 to do half the parking lot. That'll park 75 cars. So each car spot, we've worked hard at coming up with this. It costs $1,000 a spot. So what we're asking, and $1,000 over the year is $20 a week. That makes it doable for almost all of us. $20 a week isn't that bad. But if, if, if we could get 50 people to do $20 a week, we could raise the money this year to do half the parking lot. I would like to do it this year. Our goal is to pave this in September. Pave the parking lot, half the parking lot in September. So what I'm asking today is that you'd make it a matter of prayer that between now and the 1st of January, you'd say in your heart that yes, we need this parking lot paved. We've put it off long enough. The church has been here now for over 25 years. It's been put off long enough. Let's just do it. And $20 a week isn't a big sacrifice. I mean, no, this place was put up by sacrifice. A lot of people sacrificed a lot for us to have what we've got today. And what we're asking as a board is would you sacrifice a little bit over this next year to do that parking lot and get it done? So that is our thought for this next year. What I've got is pledge forms. I'm going to get the ushers to come forward. We're going to pass them out. It's got a nice picture of parking lot on it. Pass them out to everybody. Don't forget some of these teenagers. They've got more money than the adults. Take them, pray over them, and uh, you'll see that there's different amounts there. Uh, what I really want you to pray is pray, Lord, can I be a person that can do one spot? If you bring one car, do one spot. If you bring two cars, you're in trouble. You'll have to, bring, have to pay for two spots, but just, just pray over them, would you? And uh, let's, let's just trust the Lord that God will speak to our hearts and that, uh, that we'll be able to, this year, do half of that parking lot. That'll finish that up, and we won't have to worry about that for a long time. Um, also, I just want to bring an update. I, I've had a lot of folks come and ask me, children's pastor, where are we at that? What's going on with that pastor? Well, it's been a process. Uh, we, we had one individual that we uh, did an interview with, we were pursuing, uh, and um, Jenny Baker was her name. Uh, she was the uh, children's pastor in Charlottetown. She was, her husband actually was involved, uh, is a manager with Walmart, and uh, they were going to be transferred from Charlottetown. They thought maybe the HRM. And so we said, okay, we'll wait and see, because she is uh, just one of the top in Canada. She didn't get transferred. So she went to Moncton instead. She, he was transferred to Moncton. So we began our search again. Uh, we've uh, approached another individual, did our first interview with them already, uh, have been in correspondence with them, and uh, we will have more to talk about that in the new year, because we're not giving up the name yet. Uh, and uh, we want to do another interview with them, but uh, we are working on a start date for them. So that is really rolling along. So uh, probably it won't be until February that we'll actually release the name, 
but uh, they are uh, they're, they're, um, in the process of um, working through some things so that they can be a part of this assembly and uh, be working here. So it is, it is progressing and uh, we do have a person, we have a, done interviews and that is moving along. So uh, we'll let you know more about that in a month or two, okay? So that's what's going on with the children's pastor. The three wise men is what we're gonna deal with today. What would happen if the three wise men were actually three wise women? Anybody know? Here's some things that I found. Oh, Sunday school. Yes, the kids can make their way out to Sunday school. Uh, keep in mind uh, Pastor John's uh, announcement. There's a couple of classes that the teachers couldn't make it in for. What would happen if the three wise men were actually three wise women? Number one, they would have asked directions and not depended upon a star. Number two, they would have arrived on time. Number three, they would have brought some more sensible gifts like diapers, feeding bottles, cute little sleeper things. If they were women, but they weren't, they were men. Matthew chapter 2, take your Bibles, open up and uh, follow along with us as we spend some time thinking about the three wise men. Uh, just, just I'll mention, we've been doing a study on, on um, the supremacy of Christ. We've, we've touched base three Sundays. We're going to step aside from that for the next few weeks, and we'll come back to it in the new year and uh, pick that up again. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 18. I'll start off with verse, verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. We think of uh, this, this story, the, the Gospel of, of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel is written for a Jewish audience. That, that's who he's writing for. It's, it's, it's a Gospel written to be particularly for the, the Jewish people so they could read it. And his, his emphasis here is to show them that Jesus Christ is King, that Jesus is Messiah. He starts off... In chapter 1, by giving the lineage and tracing Christ back to David to show that he has the right of the throne of David. Showing that he has the right to be king. And as he goes into chapter 2, he begins to tell the story about the, the, the Magi. And in, in, in chapter 2, he tells the story about these Gentiles that come, and they come with their great question. And the most important thought of the, the story of the three wise men is found in, in verse 2, and it says this. And they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Matthew pulls this from all the stories that surround the birth of Christ. And his purpose of adding this story in, the other gospel writers don't. The reason that Matthew adds this in, if you could imagine them trying to write the story and they having to condense it and the the thousands of stories around the life of Christ. Uh, John said all the books in the world couldn't contain it. For them to just to pull the right stories, Matthew pulls a story out to show that Jesus Christ was king of the Jews, that he was Messiah. Verse 3. Let's go on down through the story. When Herod heard when Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. When Herod 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they, stopped, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense or frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. Three things I want to talk about this morning. First one is this. What the wise men sought. What were they looking for? What were they after? You think about these, these individuals. We call them the three wise men. We don't know if there were three or not. There may have been four. We just know that they brought three gifts. So we assume three gifts, three wise men. And the question is, who were these wise men? Who were they? Where were they from? Well, we, we, we are told that they, are, uh, that they, they came, uh, they were magi, and they came from the east. Go to our next slide. Our next slide is a, actually a 6th century mosaic. Um, this, uh, this mosaic is one of our earliest pictures of the three wise men. And uh, we can pick a few things out that uh, whoever did this mosaic, 6th century, what was believed in, sixth century, in the 6th century about who these men were. Now, we can know a few things about them. Uh, number one, we can know what they're wearing. Uh, it's unusual, their, their clothing, because they are wearing pants. Back in that day, most people wore robes. They did not wear pants. Only one culture wore pants, and that were Persians. The second thing we can note is the style of their hat. Their hats kind of droop down, but they, they come up to a point, which again tells us something about it. What culture wore that style of a hat? It was Persian. By looking at them, it would appear that these individuals were Persians. Another reason it points is that they may have been from Persia. Oh, let me mention another thing. Let me just toss this in. Uh, one of the traditions that we have that has been brought from Persia. Aaron had us greet one another. How do we greet people? We shake their hands. Persians were the ones that shook hands. Most other people would greet by a hug or a kiss. I just thought that was interesting. Something else we can note from this picture uh, that tradition tells us, if you look closely, you'll find that the, the first guy has a dark beard. If you look at the second one, it has no beard. And the third one has a white beard. And you'll find in all of our traditions about the three wise men, there are three different ages. Some portraits show them as three different colors. And the thought from this is that they came symbolizing the whole of the Gentile world. Every age, every color, every race that they symbolized when they come. That's, that's how tradition has interpreted them. What do we know about the Magi? Uh, the Magi, here's, here's another, th another thought. The word Magi that's found in the New Testament isn't a, isn't a Greek word, but it's a Persian word. What would that tell you? They were from Persia. Now let's go a little bit further. Now, the Persian wise men, the, the, 
the, the country of Persia had a group of wise men. Uh, the, these individuals were, uh, some people twist it around and say magi is the word that we get our word magic from, and it is. But the magi of Persia were not magicians. In fact, they were very opposite of magicians. They were the teachers, they were the priests, they were the physicians, they were astrologists, they were prophets, and they were interpreters of dreams. Two of the main things that we can take note of these individuals is that they were astrologists and dream interpreters. How were the wise men led? By a star. What else led the wise men? There was a second thing they were led by. A dream. Who said the dream? You got it. A dream. Again, which would point us to this group of priests from Persia. Who were the wise men? The wise men of, of Persia, there was a man by the name of Zoroaster. Let me talk a little bit about him. Zoroaster. Zoroaster was born about a thousand years before Christ. It's interesting that the, the disciples of Zoroaster were referred to as Magi. Zoroaster, uh, Plato referred to him as the example of the wise sage, of a man of deep wisdom. Zoroaster, at the age 30, he began to have uh, a, a being began to speak to him, reveal himself to him. He referred to him as the Lord of Wisdom. And the Lord of Wisdom began to speak to Zoroaster. And he said this. He told him that the religions around him were false. The religions around him were being, uh, the priests were using magic, manipulation and fear to control the people. And this Lord of Wisdom said, do not follow these multiple gods and these priests that use manipulation. This Lord of Wisdom said that there is one God and one God alone that you must worship. He also revealed to this man that there was a great war going on in the unseen world between good and evil. That God on one side wanted to bring good into this world, but there was another side, we refer to it as the demonic world, that wants to bring evil in here. And the war, this great war between good and evil, he referred to it as the, the war between the lie and the truth. We know who the truth is, amen? It's Jesus Christ. And he said, the way that we win the war is by making the right choices to follow truth. It almost sounds like this man had an, an appointment with God, doesn't it? Well, this God of wisdom came to him. And in one of the revelations, he revealed to him that there was going to be a savior that would be born on the earth. And this Savior would be born of a virgin. And the birth of this child would be heralded by a star. You think there's enough coincidences to say that maybe it was the Magi, the disciples of this man, that actually went to follow the star? I can't say whether it is or it isn't. Something else interesting about Zoroaster. Zoroaster believed that he was born in the last period of time. He was born a thousand years before Christ. And he believed that he was born in this last, at the beginning of the last period. The last period of time, he said, was 3,000 years. And at the end of 3,000 years, he foresaw a great war between good and evil. What's 3,000 years from a thousand years before Christ? Someone help me out with that. Yeah. He believed that there would be a great war between good and evil, and good would triumph, and then all things would begin new. We refer to that battle as the Battle of Armageddon. Zoroaster pointed to our day 
and said that the good, the God, the truth is going to come to the earth and defeat evil. We believe Jesus Christ is coming soon. My thoughts come from the book Philosophies and Religious Leaders. This is what this book is saying about Zoroaster. The wise men, who they were. Second of all, the wise men and the journey. If you think of the wise men and the journey, there's, there's an interesting parallel between the wise men and their journey. If they came from Persia, Persia's in that same area where Abraham came from. And there's an interesting parallel because these men left the same area as Abraham, traveled the same route as Abraham because to get from uh, Persia or the Ur of the Chaldees, to get there, you can't head straight over because you have to cross the desert. 1,000 miles, seven, 700 kilometers through straight desert. You're not going to go that way. 700 miles, 1,000 kilometers through desert. You're not going to go that way. You have to follow the route, the same as that uh, Abraham did. These men left the land that Abraham had left traveled the route that Abraham had traveled, went to the location that Abraham was going because they had faith in a singular God. Just an interesting parallel. Here's something else that's interesting. I think it's interesting. Where are the three wise men now? Someone said dead and gone. Uh, Let's go to our next slide. This is the uh, cathedral in um, Cologne, Germany. And this cathedral is known for having a shrine in it to the three wise men. And in the uh, shrine, go to our next slide. Uh, that's, that's the shrine. And this is just, if you happen to be interested in this, uh, if you're ever over to Germany, you can go there and you can see the shrine. Inside the shrine is three sets of bones. These three sets of bones actually uh, date back to um, Helena, the mother of Constantine. Those who know a bit of church history know that Helena had a real thing for the relics of Christianity. And Helena searched for the three wise men found their graves, dug up their bodies, and brought them to Constantinople. 800 years ago, they were transported from there to Cologne, Germany. And that very well may be the resting place of the actual three wise men. Isn't that interesting? Some people don't, you know, But to me, that's interesting. Back to our subject, what they sought. And they asked, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Three things we can note of what they uh, were, were, were looking for. Number one, they were looking for a man. We saw his star in the east. Second of all, we can know that they were looking for a monarch because he was born king. And not only that, we can see that they were looking for a Messiah because he was born to be king of the Jews. He was to be born of a virgin. He was to be heralded in the heavens by the star that he was to be savior of the world. They came not just seeking a man. They came seeking a savior. They were coming seeking the Messiah. Can I ask, what are we looking for this Christmas? Are we looking for something under the tree, the latest toy? I'm talking to the man. We men like toys. What are we looking for? Are we looking for a new pair of shoes and the guys could care less about shoes? That's more for the girls. What are you looking for? What are we looking for? I believe that this year we should be seeking the Savior. If you think when they they, they came, the Bible says that uh, when the, the wise men came, he says that all of Jerusalem was wondering what was going on. How far was it to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem 
was a 10 kilometer walk. Yet we find only three went, the three wise men. All of Jerusalem was excited about the thought of the birth of the Messiah. We know that the chief priests and elders knew it was to be in Bethlehem. But nobody went but the three wise men. Nobody was interested in making the journey. Jesus is less than 10 kilometers away. He's as close as the mention of his name. What are we seeking this year? Here's one of my sayings. You'll find what you're looking for if you look for it hard enough. The wise men went out and they sought the baby. They watched the star. And they found the Christ. Are we seeking Jesus? Can I say, if we sought Jesus as much as we're seeking something under the tree, if we put as much time into seeking Jesus as we do into buying presents, we could find him. You'll find what you're looking for if you look for it hard enough. We need to be seeking Jesus. We need to be seeking after Jesus. Second of all, what they thought. Verse 1 again. We find the Magi came to the east and that they come during the time of King Herod and they come into Jerusalem and ask, where is he that is born King of the Jews? All of Jerusalem is stirred. Verse 3. It was different when these three wise men came in. Jerusalem was was used to having dignitaries. They were used to having uh, individuals who would be traveling to Jerusalem. Individuals who are coming there for different reasons. Most often they're coming, they will be coming to, uh, for, for uh, religious reasons. They're coming to feasts. That was common. But these men did not come to seek out a, a feast. They didn't come to spend time with the, the, the chief priest. They didn't come looking to meet with the king. These men came to find a baby. They came looking for a child. They were different. All Jerusalem was stirred up because they looked different. Here's, this is a um, second, third century uh, painting that's in the catacombs of, um, of Rome, of the three wise men. I just thought that was interesting, thought I'd show you that picture. When they came, they came looking for a baby. They looked different. They were dressed different. You could tell when you looked at them, they were not Jews. Jews wore the robes. The Jewish robes had tassels at the end of the bottom of them, around the hem of them, there was tassels. These men were not dressed like pilgrims. They were not dressed like individuals that were coming for some uh, worship time. All of Jerusalem was stirred by their question. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why did they come? Two reasons. They came, number one, personal revelation. They came because they had seen the star. They were coming because they had a personal revelation in their heart that the Messiah was born. These men had faith. They had traveled for hundreds of miles. They had traveled for months in order to get there. These were men of faith, believing in a singular God, believing the singular God was sending a Savior, believing that singular Savior would be born in a manger, believing that 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 the God that would be sending a Savior would be born of a virgin in the manger. These were men of faith. The second thing I see that uh, why they came was not only they were men of faith, 
to have a personal revelation of who God was. But they were also individuals who knew that if they, they were to come, they had to come and worship God. The word worship means to bow down before. The Persian word that's equal to word, the word worship that's used here means to bow down, prostrate, and put your forehead on the ground. The position of worship when they presented the gifts was not bowing on one knee, but they laid prostrate with their forehead on the ground when they presented the gifts. But that's the picture that you should see when you see the wise men. Not them kneeling, but them face in the ground, worshiping the Savior. They came to worship. They came to, to, to do what they knew only belonged to God because God alone deserves worship. And they came to adore Him and to worship Him. We find in this process, as they're, as they're going through what they were thinking, and you wonder, guys, what were you thinking? Because in this process of seeking the Savior, they substituted personal revelation for reasoning. It seems that the star disappeared for some time. Whether it was cloudy, whether we're, we're not sure. But later on it says the star appeared again to them. But whatever happened, whether it was the clouds blocked the star, they went for a period and they didn't know what to do, so they went and asked King Herod. Of all people to ask, King Herod. We know that, that, that King Herod was a was a he was a, a madman. He was a murderer. But did you also know that King Herod was a genius? How many knew that? Let me tell you a couple of good things about King Herod. He is the villain. But King Herod was one of the greatest builders of his day. Let me give you a few examples. Masada. There's Masada. Uh, you're familiar with the story of Masada, of course, from the uh, 70 AD, 73 AD. Uh, just before 70 AD, a group of Jews went up and captured Masada. Masada was the, the, uh, the, one of the palaces that was built by Herod on top of a mountain. And they went up and they took it over. 70 AD, when they marched in Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, they began to uh, say, well, we've got to get the Jews that are on top of this mountain. And they spent years trying to get them out of that temple. That's that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that palace. Because it was so secure. They actually had to build a ramp. How many remember the story? They had to build a ramp all the way up the side of the mountain in order to finally invade it. Sada was built by Herod. Not only was Masada built by Herod. Let me give you another one. Caesarea. Herod built a temple there. He also built the, the, that magnificent port that was built by Herod. Tiberius. Caesarea, you know from the Bible. Tiberius, you know. This is the ruins of Tiberius. Still there today, built by Herod. He built his temple, his, his, sorry, his uh, palace in Jerusalem. And there his, his palace in Jerusalem, magnificent. His greatest, he built a number of temples as well to pagan gods, but his greatest accomplishment was two locations. Number one, the Temple Mount. There's a wailing wall. Who built the wailing wall? Herod. The Temple Mount was actually a small place. Herod made this large platform. The, uh, the Dome of the Rock sets there now. Uh, but the whole Temple Mount was built by him, uh, 1,600 feet by 900 feet. And the genius of this is underneath that, that platform, it's filled with tunnels and caves. They actually designed it underneath with tunnels and caves. And then he laid huge stones. A number of the stones weighed a hundred tons. Moved by men. One of the stones actually is estimated to, be, to weigh 600 tons. 
and building the foundation for this wall. Nine stories tall places. It's built by Herod. And on top of that, his greatest accomplishment, he built what we refer to as Herod's Temple, which is this magnificent <clears throat> temple, which was still under construction in Jesus' day. But it was the temple that Jesus entered in. When Jesus talked about going into the temple and, and the money changers and dealing with all that, it was that building, and that building was made by Herod. He was a genius, but he was also a madman. He was paranoid. He was afraid someone would steal his throne. And this, 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 this mad paranoia that he had in his mind led him to kill two of his brothers-in-laws, kill one of his wives, kill two of his sons, kill many of the Jews, and massacre infants in Bethlehem. That's who Herod was. He was paranoid. And Herod was paranoid even more so during the birth of Christ because there was this, this prophecy that, that a Savior would, would, would be born and this person who would be born would free the Jewish people from the Romans. So this, 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 this genius, this madman, could you imagine how paranoid he was when he heard these men come and say, where is he that was born king of the Jews? Let me toss this in. Interesting. We find four people with faith. Four people with faith in this chapter. The three wise men. And the only other person we find that had faith in the birth of the Messiah was Herod. You ever think about that? Herod said, look for the child and let me know. Because he wanted to kill him. Where were the priests? Where are the teachers of the law? Well, I just thought, well, well, that was interesting. Well, those wise men came. They said the Savior's born. Going to be born in Bethlehem. Oh, honey, pour me another cup of coffee. You'll never guess what I heard today. Let's check out the newspaper. But Herod believed. He was a madman, but he believed. For the wrong reasons, but he believed. And Herod realized what was taking place. Because the wise man substituted their personal revelation for reasoning and sought Herod's help, Herod sent his troops into Bethlehem and he took vengeance on every child under two years old in the vicinity of Bethlehem and killed them all because they sought a man instead of following the star. And can I say to us today, we need to be following the star. I'm not talking about following some rock star. We need to be following the star. I'm not talking about some movie star or some falling star. I'm talking about we need to be following Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 16, it says, Jesus said, I am the root, the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Folks, that's who we should be following. We should be following Jesus Christ. Stop trying to think things through and reason things through, and, but just follow Jesus. Because he wants to personally reveal himself to you. And he wants your response to be a personal worship of him. Follow Jesus. He is the true star. What they sought, what they thought, and finally what they brought. They came and they brought their gifts. And he says gold incense. The word incense means frankincense and myrrh. Three things. Gold, first of all. Gold. Why gold? There's a gold nugget. I'd like to have one about that size. How about you? Why gold? Gold, of course, is the most precious metals known of that day. 
Gold is the most valuable gift, the most precious metal for the most precious Savior. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold makes sense to us. You can spend gold. I don't know if it was gold like that or gold coins. I have no idea. But frankincense and myrrh. Why frankincense and myrrh? Let me give you a couple of things. Frankincense and myrrh. Number one, either one of them was more valuable than gold, more expensive than gold. Second thing we can note is the combination of frankincense and myrrh was referred to as what the gods of heaven smelled. Frankincense and myrrh were two of the ingredients in the holy anointing oil used in the temple. Frankincense and myrrh. First of all, frankincense. Frankincense points towards the cross. It was uh, used, uh, was found on the table of showbread. It was found uh, when they did meat offerings. They'd pour uh, uh, frankincense on it. Uh, the anointing oil had frankincense and myrrh in it. Uh, the, the, the anointing oil was the symbol of the presence of God. It was the anointing oil that when they anointed the king, they'd come and bring that oil. It wasn't olive oil, it was the anointing oil. And they'd pour over the heads of the individuals being anointed. And they would have a smell about them. It was strictly forbidden that anybody should mix together frankincense and myrrh in the combination used for temple worship. It was strictly forbidden. Forbidden. It was a particular fragrance only for the temple, only for those who are anointed by God. It was that fragrance. When you smelled it, you smelled the fragrance that reminded you of God. Frankincense and myrrh. How did they get frankincense? Frankincense was actually tapped from a tree. And the first picture, you find the guy with the, the turban. What they do to the frankincense tree is they take a knife and they put stripes on the tree. They wound the tree. And from those wounds, you'll find that it will bleed out. This, this, uh, uh, that the sap of the tree comes out and it forms what they refer to as tears. And you can see why they call it tears, because they're shaped like tears. And those tears, when they're hardened... It's frankincense. It's a rare tree in the Holy Land. Only in a certain location can they get this called frankincense. The tree is wounded. The tree bleeds. The tree sheds tears. Who does that remind you of? Someone was wounded for us. Someone bled for us. Someone wept tears, shed tears like blood falling from his forehead. Someone was pierced for us. Points to Jesus Christ. Why frankincense? Because frankincense talks about the presence of God and points towards the cross. Why myrrh? The word myrrh means bitter. The, the myrrh is gathered a very similar method as, as the, uh, the frankincense. It's, 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 it's well the same type of thing as sap from the tree that comes and they will wound the tree. The tree will bleed. And then the sap that comes from it is turned into a perfume. And you see the little bottle of perfume that is there. It's turned into an oil. The oil of myrrh. Again, myrrh is used in the anointing oil. Myrrh was also offered to Christ on the cross. Myrrh was also used for the embalming of the body of Jesus. Frankincense and myrrh, the symbol of the presence of God. I don't think it was any coincidence that when they brought their gifts, they brought gold, but they also brought frankincense and myrrh because it was a symbol of the anointing and the presence of God upon a king that was more valuable than anything else in the world. 
they brought gifts and presented to the king. I invite the team to come as we conclude and say this. What they sought, what should we seek? They sought a Messiah. What should we be seeking? We should be seeking Jesus Christ, our King. Christmas time, if you think of the, uh, the, uh, the, the time that uh, is set aside, Christmas for the, the, the church is a time to celebrate the birth of Christ. But Christmas time, historically for the church, has been a time for preparation for the return of Christ. And I think that as we look at the, the world today, we should be thinking, Jesus Christ is coming soon. Is my heart right with him? We should be preparing for the king. What they thought, they turned revelation over and went after reasoning. Folks, we need to follow revelation. We need to follow the star. We need to follow Jesus. But we need to bring him a gift. He's not looking for gold, frankincense, and myrrh today. Romans chapter 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. We need to come and offer ourselves to Jesus Christ. The wise men came and they knelt before a manger. They prostrated themselves before God. They placed their forehead on the ground. They placed their face on the floor of that old house. And they worshiped the king. And God calls us to do the same thing. Someone said, wise men still seek him. Wise women still seek him. If we're wise today, we'll believe in a savior. We'll believe in the true star, the bright and morning star. And we'll give our lives as our act of worship to serve him. Father, we bow in your presence right now.